What can you get out of your experience working at a large farm, a hundred plus acre farm? Sometimes you can get a lot more than you expect, including your own biointensive farm. We're gonna hear from Mike coming up on how he did that in this one, stay tuned. Today I'm in Camarillo on the Oxnard Plain in Southern California. That noise you hear in the background or maybe you hear is the 101 freeway which is about 25 yards behind the camera right there. So we are in prime real estate land but it's all zoned agriculture and it's been this way for 100 plus years. What you have here is a historic family farm that I think is about 300 acres in size that's grown mixed vegetables over the years. There's a lot of raspberries in the background under those big tunnels way back there. But there's also some small things happening and really some changes taking place because the owner of the property is looking to transition the farm, which is certified organic now, and kind of pass on the farming legacy to a different generation. That's where Mike Roberts, the farmer of Baby Root Farm right here comes in. Mike's somebody who's worked on this farm for seven plus years and along the way he built a relationship with the farmer, he showed work ethic, he gained experience and now he's in a position to lease back some of that land. Just half an acre in an area where leases are typically in the hundreds of acres in size. So he's leasing out half an acre at a very favorable rate for what it is down here in Southern California, about $3,000 a year. That includes water, access to all the infrastructure, and he can market his product under the bigger brand name at some of the big farmers markets down here, like Santa Monica and Hollywood, which can be huge farmers markets. So today we're gonna to talk about what he's doing on his farm in a micro scale, some unique ways he's doing things to maximize the space that he has, only being half an acre, and how he's taking advantage of the bigger farm brand to help establish his little farm and get it off to a good start. So once again, when you think you can't learn anything from bigger agriculture, think again, because likely you can learn a lot more than you thought at first glance. Hey, I'm Mike Roberts. Uh, welcome to Baby Root Farm. We're here in Camarillo, California at the beautiful, historic McGrath Ranch. Phil's dad, around uh, World War II, they started um, growing more varieties of crops. And at this time is when the chemical um, agriculture became prominent in our area, uh, in most areas. So at this time, the McGraths, along with most other farmers, we started uh, farming chemically out here. Uh, and that went on until the 80s, 90s. Around that time, Phil uh, took over, who's our farmer today. And he, uh, because of a couple uh, personal issues with his father passing away uh, from cancer, which he thought may have had an uh, association with a lifetime of working with these chemicals, and then demand, educated demand from the farmer's market. We'd be at Santa Monica, or we'd be at Hollywood, and every other question would be, are these carrots organic? Are these beets organic? So really, our market pushed us to uh, go organic, and Phil is one of the first to go certified organic in our area in the um, in the 80s and 90s when the certification became prominent out here. Uh, and then today, as Phil is starting to move towards retirement, he's supporting a lot of us who have farmed here for a lot of years to start our own farm ventures um, underneath his umbrella. So. We're excited to see what the next generation of uh, farmers look like here at McGrath. Mike, you have a pretty unique setup here, like you're leasing back land from a former mentor. Can you talk about how working under an older farmer has paid dividends for you now starting your own farm? Absolutely. Uh, just that mentorship that you mentioned, I didn't have to start everything on my own. I got to come into an existing system and I got to uh, learn and get paid while I learned, right? I was an employee here. I, I worked on this farm for a lot of years and um, also taught me how to sell. I went to, uh, you know, he's the kind that would just throw you out there, push you out to the farmer's markets um, and, uh, and overall just run a farm, run the tractors, all these kinds of traditional organic uh, methods and also gave us room to grow. Taught me how to give tours, talks, educational uh, workshops that we offer here. So I got to do that all under his umbrella and then as he's moving on to a different phase of his life um, and with no uh, real heirs around, there's a lot of opportunity for those of us that are here to step into those shoes and keep the, the mission going forward. And one last thing I want to throw in there is the infrastructure. Infrastructure is all in place. So meaning that we already have wash station, we already have a cooler, uh, and I can pay a per, uh, percentage of the rent for those kinds of things. So super beneficial uh, versus me trying to go out and do it, um, you know, 100% by myself. 
And the nice thing about this is too, you're leasing it back, it's already all certified organic. Absolutely. So you can just step in and go with that. Absolutely, yep. You know, from a lease standpoint, how do you justify looking at terms of a lease, like how much you're gonna pay per acre when you go to lease this back? You have half an acre here. Right. Some people can look at, you know, lease payments is expensive, but in an area like this, if you can lease, get a favorable lease, it might be the only way you can access land. Yeah, definitely, right? Uh, it's, it's here, it's available to me. It has all the hookups on it. Um, and uh, relatively speaking, I feel it's inexpensive based on what the potential yield for the style of farming that I'm doing here, which I which would be called as biointensive or regenerative styles. Um, to me, the the lease price is very in line. Again, it, it does cover my my rent costs and my also my use of the utilities and the facilities as well. So uh, we have an office here that I could use if if we needed to have a meeting. Uh, I can offer tours, and I would uh, work out some. We're still setting this up. This is relatively new. We just broke ground this year, but I can work out a um, a deal with the uh, uh, with the McGrath family. Uh, on, you know, if I'm offering tours, maybe a percentage could go back to the farm. So a lot of this, we're just working our way through, but very confident that as long as we're looking out to make sure it's mutually beneficial, this is a, a huge, um, uh, you know, potential here. So one thing that we're moving towards is a big push towards California native plants for many reasons. Um, what we're, we're told um, is that they're going to be a habitat for beneficial insects, also uh, for the monarchs, for native bees. We have devastating east winds out here on the Oxnard Plains. Just rip our, our infrastructure up, or destroy our plants, spread uh, disease and weed seed. And some of these that we plant are going to be 20 feet tall. Big trees and shrubs of California natives. Of course, we have them planted on the north side or strategically where it's not casting a shadow, but we need wind breaks out here. Um, and uh, also the beauty, just we have, we've always farmed traditional row cropping out here on in Ventura County and on uh, the Oxnard Plain specifically, uh, we're all row crops. And just to have some different, uh, you know, anything besides just plants growing, to have some bushes, shrubs, trees, I think are gonna be amazing and also pays homage to the Native Americans, the Chumash, who had this land for 13,000 years before, um, you know, Spain came, Mexico, and then uh, European uh, settlers, the far early farmers. So we want to start just rediscovering their uses, the nutritional, the medicinal value of some of these California natives. And we've already spoken to a lot of the chefs and they're really excited to start figuring out what to do with toyon berries and holly leaf cherry and uh, all these historically significant crops. So windbreak, beauty, habitat, uh, and food and uh, medicine are uh, some of the reasons we're really pushing towards California natives. So because we have a very tiny land base, we forced a positive constraint. So we are pushing ourselves to really maximize our bed space, even over and above um, what I've read and heard about. Uh, what we're doing here in this particular case is we're interplanting, we have our Salanova, uh, and interplanted in the Salanova are five lines of 21-day radishes, Sora red radish interplanting amongst four lines of the Salanova. So this is our plan uh, for the winter. We're not doing any crops that are more than 21 days, uh, day to maturity. Um, because in the winter here in Southern California, our winter is like spring other place. It's just, it's really mild. So we can be growing these crops, um, you know, pretty much outdoors uncovered uh, and they will still grow. But the day to maturity is gonna double for us. So if it says 21 days, I know it's gonna be 42 days, which is still manageable in terms of quick turnover in a small space. So again, Salanova here, four lines, and then five lines of interplanted radishes. These radishes are about to come off pretty soon, and then the Salanova just grows into each other. Uh, we're gonna try, let's say we cut that Salanova back, we're gonna see if we can do another 21-day radish in there, uh, in between over the winter. So we'll see if, uh, I don't know what the, the return times on the Salanova is gonna be. This is our first winter growing it, but uh, I'm imagining it's very slow. So that's what we're, we're working on here. On half an acre, how are you finding the workload and how are you finding it financially working out for you? Okay, so when, when I say half acre, the whole space is a half acre. Um, uh, just to specify, we have a half acre, 50% of our land is open space right now. We want to have access roads. We just broke ground, so we want to live in the space a little bit to see how it's going to work out. We have 25% either in or allocated for California natives. Another 12.5% are in essential infrastructure, storage, buildings, and then only 12.5% are in these intensive bed production, which is 3,000 square feet. Uh, so in terms of our time allocation, once we're set up, we're doing, uh, and it's usually two, two of us, uh, we're doing Tuesday, 
harvest in the morning and uh, flipping over beds, seeding them, whatever else needs to be done, repairing irrigation in the afternoon. And then same thing on Friday. We're harvesting for the weekend markets and uh, sales. And then in the afternoon, whatever needs to get done. So two days a week, two of us, essentially two bodies can uh, run this farm. And I think we can get that down to two half days on Tuesday and two, and uh, Friday, especially as we get more essential uh, and appropriate technology. We're doing all this by hand. No tractor. We're flipping these beds with uh, stirrup hose, um, you know, using a pitchfork to, um, to aerate them. So once we get into the more appropriate technologies, uh, we are using a cedar. Uh, we want to bring in the paper pot transplanter potentially. That's why I know we can cut these way, way down. 3,000 square feet, what are the production numbers coming off of this? We're doing right now about 200 pounds a week. We pull about 100 pounds on Tuesday, 100 pounds on Friday, and we're doing about $1,000 in gross sales every week right now. And we just went into full production September 5th. Today is October 9th, I believe. So that's about a month into full production. And your main outlet for this is all farmer's markets? Uh, farmer's markets, we have a roadside market here. Uh, we sell to aggregators, uh, local buyers, uh, such as our buddy Max, and um, CSA boxes at chefs, restaurants, so a little bit to everybody. When you lease a farm that already has infrastructure in place, one of the cool things that you can use as a leasee on that land, depending on how the lease is structured, is you can use that infrastructure. Right behind me is an example of that. That's a farm stand. Right behind that is Highway 101 that cuts from Central California down into Southern California. So Mike is a small farmer just farming half an acre on this land can use this farm stand to put his produce in. It's another way to generate revenue and it's another thing thing that comes with the lease if you look for the right problem. What you actually have behind me right here are certified organic raspberry plants under all these high tunnels. I mean there are 200 yards that way, 200 yards that way, who knows how much this way. This is farmed by Driscoll. Now this is on the same property that Mike is farming on. I think Driscoll's leasing something like 200 acres, Mike's leasing half an acre. His half an acre is right behind the tripod right there. So on one side you have big scale ag, certified organic big scale ag growing raspberries. On the other side you have small scale ag coming into play. One thing Mike is really big on is getting into small scale ag, working on more regenerative practices, helping educate new and younger farmers and getting them into the game. That's what he's got going on here. It's a really cool set up and it just goes to show the value of putting in your time and building that social capital. He worked at this farm for seven years. Along the way he built relationships with people, he acquired some skills, and now that's all paying off in spades because he can lease land at a pretty good rate, which is up here in the Oxnard Plain up in Ventura County. So don't be afraid to put the time in, don't be afraid to look for creative ways to find land if it doesn't look like it's easy, and don't ever undervalue the true value of experience because it's worth so much more than you might initially think it is at face value. Coming to you from Oxnard, California. Thanks for watching this one. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.